Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as I said in my um, YouTube in invitation to you, we think we are your peeps. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in your, uh, so I'm going to ask some questions, and then we will have some opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, in your TED Talk, which I really enjoyed, you said that discovery requires us to boil things down to their fundamental truths and reason up from there. So that's a mindset that you live every day. For a lot of us, um, when we think about what could be, we often get stopped by obstacles and what, what the impediments are. And you have clearly blown through those. So how do you think about that, and, and how do you focus on getting by those obstacles? Uh, well, I, I'm a big believer in the, um, in the sort of uh, science or physics framework of trying to analyze problems, particularly if, the, if they're new. Um, so if, if something's new, then analogies don't, don't work very well um, because it's, 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 it's new. I mean, it, the way we get through daily life is mostly by analogy um, or by sort of copying things with minor variations because um, it's a computational shortcut. Uh, but if you want to do something that's, that's fundamentally new, uh, or particularly if it's counterintuitive, then you have to do a first principles analysis um, and, and you know, take things from, from the, what, what appear to be as fundamental, sort of simple fundamental truths, and then reason up from there. Um, and uh, I mean, that, that requires a lot more sort of thinking, and you can't, you can't do that for everything. But, um, but if you're trying to figure out something new, I think it's, it's really the only way to go. So um, I mentioned that, that I was in Paris, and I know that you were there too. And uh, as I listened to presentations, uh, first there was a, a real sense of optimism at this COP that I don't think was there before. But there was still an overwhelming sense of a lot of work that we have to do. And I was struck by... Um, some comments that you made when you were talking to a group of students at the Sorbonne, uh, uh, and they were talking about sustainability. And you said regarding the carbon cycle, this is analogous to not paying for garbage collection. It's not as though we should say in the case of garbage, have a garbage-free society. It's very difficult to have a garbage-free society, but it's just important that people pay for the garbage collection. So we need to go from having an untaxed negative externality, which is effectively a hidden carbon sub subsidy of enormous size, 5.3 million trillion a year, and we need to move away from this and have a carbon tax. So can you talk a little bit about that, especially from the sure. standpoint of being in private <coughs> enterprise? Yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, prices are just information. Um, they, they the primary information um, to allow for labor, labor allocation. Um, and I mean, they, they sort of tell people what, what to do and what things should be favored over another thing. Um, and, and so when the prices are, are wrong, then the wrong thing happens in the economy. Um, so when you have a, sort of a tragedy of the commons, um, like the CO2 capacity of the oceans and atmosphere, um, and it's, it's unpriced, or so the price is, is much lower than it than it should be, um, then the wrong behavior happens. So if effectively, uh, we're, we're incenting bad behavior. Um, and um, I mean, I just talked about how analogies are imperfect, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of like if, if we had uh, high taxes on, on fruits and vegetables and low taxes on, on cigarettes and alcohol. That, would, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but that, that's sort of what we have. Um, right now, with respect to energy, um, and and um, and we're very powerful forces trying to keep it that way. Um, so um, now, it, it, it will eventually um, correct, but and, and we, we are seeing some good movement in that direction with uh, the Paris climate talks. It, it, it sounds like it's direct directionally correct, and um, and there'll be some movement, not as much as there should be, but it, it, it's it's uh, encouraging. Um, and um, I, mean, I think it, it, it's worth noting that, like, generally, when 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 the government interferes in the economy, it's 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 that usually results in a in a, uh, 
a pricing error increase. Um, but in this case, uh, I think it would, it would be, it's hard to miss. Like any, any sort of carbon tax would reduce the effect of error in the um, system of prices in the economy. Yeah. Um, I'd like to shift directions. Uh, while we are a research community, we're also an education community. And uh, we have crowdsourced some questions for today's event. And one of them comes uh, from the education community. So this came to us uh, on Twitter from Regina Brinker, uh, at Brinker Science, if you want to follow her. And she says, I teach middle school STEM. What should students be learning to be prepared for and contribute to the future workforce? Um, well, I think, um, I mean, software engineering is um, probably the single biggest area that, that people should learn. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think, I think I'm always a sort of a fan of, of physics and uh, general economics and critical thinking. I think those are, we really should teach critical thinking a lot more because uh, mm -hmm. pe people, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, that may seem like a simple thing, but it's it's just um, it, like you need to just tell people like this is how you know whether you should believe something or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like you can you can tell how much everybody resonates yeah, yeah, with that. Like, here. I think I'm preaching to the converted here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, you know, just teaching people these are the general types of fallacies, and this is how people will generally trick you, and how to avoid being tricked, and that kind of thing. It'd be really great. It would. Yeah. It would. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the fall meeting here, uh, we also try to tr uh, stress the importance of transdisciplinary research, and how science informs other areas like uh, policy and so forth. So another question we received from Twitter uh, came from Lori Zielkowski. She's at Extra New Neutrons, um, who asked, so you didn't mention geoscience in that list of things that people should know about. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I do think geoscience is very important, let me be clear. <laughs> Um, I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do the engineers of the future need to know from geosciences, and how can uh, how do we influence that and work together? Um, well, I mean, I think in, in general, I think that it'd be good in general for people to know about geosciences and um, to know how um, our actions um, as a civilization will, will affect the future, um, or and you know how we can positively affect it, how we might be negatively affecting it, um, you know. On the assumption that we want the future to be good, uh, we want to direct our actions to, um, you know, with respect to, to geosciences, to to a good outcome. Um, so, I, I, it, you know, generally, it's, it's 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 sort of quite surprising how little actually people know uh, about about geosciences. I mean, even like pretty straightforward stuff like the carbon cycle. You know, sort of. Um, I mean, I've had conversations with with, with quite quite smart and well-read people. Who, um, who who don't understand that there's like a surface carbon cycle, and and then but if you dig stuff up from deep underground and add it to the surface carbon cycle, that 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 fundamentally changes the chemical equilibrium of the of the surface of the earth, um, and they're like, wow, really? Yeah, yeah, really, <laughs> definitely. Um, and um, you know, like there's just conservation of mass is not totally obvious to people. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, like you can't just create new carbon from nothing. Um, mm -hmm. You have to and you can't get it from it somewhere. And you can't disappear. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't disappear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, just like basic stuff like that would be um, like great to educate people on. Terrific. Um, I. I we're sort of bouncing around, but I have some, you know, I, we got great input from all of you uh, when we ask for questions, and I want to make sure we try to uh, touch on a lot of different topics. So um, I want to talk about the roles of the private and public sector in ensuring the advancement of scientific research and innovation. And where do you see 
um, the roles of the private sector versus the public sector? Are there places where they overlap? Are they sure. totally separate? Yeah, I, th I think the public sector is when, when you have something that's um, kind of a small amount of good for the whole population uh, or for you know, the whole country or even the whole, the whole world, um, but it would be really difficult to go and collect like $10 from everyone um, to understand um, you know, more about the nature of the Earth or the solar system or the universe. Um, so you, you, it's, it's, sort of, it's not efficient to, go to try and sort of you know, collect sort of this. If, you, if you've got, say, a, you know, a $3 billion project to go and get $10 from everyone in the United mm -hmm. States, it's, like, it's, it's, it's better to do that uh, via the public sector. Um, and, um, and but then you know you have great things like like the Hubble, um, and I think most people would say like you know, that's that's quite a quite a good thing, um, or, the, or the Mars missions. Um, so I think um, you know w w where where you have these things which are a small amount of good for for a lot of people, it makes sense for the public sector to, to you know for government to do that. Um, w where you can um, more concretely uh, close the economic loop. Um, uh, that that's where the private sector makes sense. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, at SpaceX, we do a lot of launches of communications and broadcast satellites, um, and and then that that can sort of close the economic loop because uh, then people can uh, listen to XM radio or get Direct TV or something like that, um, and and that kind of makes sense. Um, but then we'll also do missions for NASA to re re resupply the space station. Um, so we can sort of learn more about living in space, uh, and that makes sense as a as a public sector thing. Um, so I think that's the basic uh, basic difference. So in that public sector, um, not only geoscience but a lot of science is seeing very flat funding at a time when uh, other nations are investing, uh, at a time when there's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, how do you think that the private sector can help us? Uh, turn that around and focus on, you know, what the benefits will be for society, for uh, public sector investment in, in research? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I'm certainly a proponent of increasing um, investment in, in science in general uh, from, you know, both the public and private sector. Um, and um, you know, I'm a super pro-science, so uh, <laughs> I am... Um, and, and it, it is, um, you know, it's interesting to see, like, um, the Large Hadron Collider, you know, that was, uh, that was really a great effort there, there in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, but we sort of canceled the superconducting super collider here in the U.S. Um, I thought, I mean, that was, that was sort, of a, a sort of a sad thing that we did there. Um, you know, I, I really think we should, we should increase uh, funding for science, absolutely, um, you know, across the world, really. Right. Uh, we have the director of the National Science Foundation in the front row here. I'm sure she's uh, yeah. in, in violent <laughs> agreement. Yeah, I mean, I've, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so you mentioned Mars, and um, uh, in your interview with Stephen Colbert, you said that Mars is a fixer-upper planet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> needs, needs but, more. <laughs> but you've also been a proponent of colonizing uh, Mars. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you think we would face in traveling to Mars? I know you're very interested in this. How do you, how do you think about that? Sure. Um, well, I think first of all, I should say, you know, why do I think this is important? Um, and and that's uh, if if I sort of un unpack the sort of uh, philosophical basis for that, as far as I'm concerned, it's uh, the reason I came to that conclusion was that um, you know I think that. Um, we, we don't. There's, there's so much more to understand and learn about the nature of the universe, um, and that understanding will will grow uh, kind of proportionate to the scope and scale of, of human civilization. Um, and um, the, the probability of the probable lifespan of human civilization is is much greater if we are a multi-planet species as opposed to a single planet species. Um, if we're a single planet species, then eventually there will be some extinction event, either um, you know, either from humans or, or some natural uh, thing. So, um, so I think, uh, and, and, and now is the first time in the history of Earth that the, the window has opened where it's possible 
for us to extend life to another planet. I mean, it's been four and a half billion years, so it's oh. a long time. Um, <laughs> and and that, that window may be open for a long time, and hopefully it is, uh, but it, it may also be open for a short time. And so I think the, the, the wise move is to make life multiplanetary while we can. Um, and, um, and, and this ultimately uh, is what will lead to um, a, a huge amount of, of new science um, and ensure that, uh, that, that we have the highest probability of, of understanding the nature of the universe. Um, so that, that's actually the, the reason that I think it's important. Um, and and I, I also think it would be a, a great adventure. Um, and you know, there need to be things that um, people look forward to when you wake up in the morning. Like it's, it's exciting and inspiring. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we need those things. Yeah, I'm yeah. old enough to rem remember the uh, landing on the moon and uh, getting up that day and right. thinking about that. Uh, and just uh, the change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's Great a, point. So, um, but but it, it, will, it will be super hard to do this. Um, and it will take a long time, and um, I, I suspect I probably won't live to see it become self-sustaining. Um, but um, it, if, if we are to aim for that objective, then you know there are important technological steps that are needed um, to to get there. Um, one of them, for example, being uh, reusable rockets. Um, if we have reusable rockets, we can reduce the, the cost of, of um, of access to space by probably two orders of magnitude. Um, and um, it's worth noting that for the, the Falcon 9, um, which is uh, about a $16 million rocket to build, the, the cost of the propellant is only um, about $200,000. So, you know, it's, it's much like uh, refueling um, like a 747 or something like that. Um, so it's, it's really a massive difference if we can make reusability work. Um, and then we also need scale. Um, we need to have really big rockets, um, and um, and then you need to do uh, local propellant production on Mars. Um, so if we can do those things, then I think we can establish a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. So I understand that you're going to be launching your uh, newest rocket next week. Right. And uh, this is the first launch since the Falcon 9. Uh, back in June, and uh, I've lost some scientific gear that was pretty expensive in the ocean, uh, <laughs> and I know what that feels like. It, maybe right. not, maybe I don't know how it scales, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, if this is successful, it's, it's clearly historic. And uh, um, how do you think about? Uh, that issue of, uh, you know, uh, failing forward. <laughs> failing forward. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, I think I'd much prefer success forward. <laughs> of um, course. But but um, yeah, it's it's I think it's quite emotionally traumatic actually, um, and uh, yeah, the the last flight which failed actually did so on my birthday, which is really oh. a bit of a downer. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, rockets are hard, I have to say. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I mean, if, if gravity was just a little lighter, <laughs> it would be much easier. Um, actually, and if gravity was a little, little stronger on Earth, it would be basically impossible to do with, with chemical rockets. It's amazing how much uh, gravity affects things. Um, I mean, <laughs> if, and like it's a small change in G, and it's like, wow. Um, uh, but you, you can look at, say, the Saturn V, which was like the size of um, the first time I think anyone's done it is uh, deep, cr deeply cryogenic propellant. Mm. So we're subcooling the, the propellant, particularly, particularly the liquid oxygen, because it's two-thirds liquid oxygen, um, close to its freezing point, um, which increases the density uh, quite, quite significantly. Um, and, um, and then the thrust is higher. We've been improved uh, stage separation system. We stretch the upper stage of the rocket um, to add more propellant to that. And there are a number of other improvements in electronics. So it's 
I think a um, significantly improved rocket from the, the last one. Um, and then I should say, what is important about reusability as far as the boost stage is concerned? Um, what the, the key sort of figure of merit is is, is the transfer um, transfer energy. Um, so if you take the potential energy and the kinetic energy um, and say how much has been transferred to the the upper stage by the boost stage, um, and, and and what's the mass that so it's basically yeah basically kinetic energy and potential energy. Transfer that that's the thing that that's the figure of merit. Um, so the the boost stage of Falcon 9 is is capable of of transfer of, of a transfer velocity to the upper stage of 8,000 kilometers an hour. So it's really it's pretty fast. Yep. Um, so a bullet from an assault rifle it goes at 2,000 kilometers an hour. So it's four times faster than a bullet from an assault rifle. Um, that's the transfer velocity at roughly 100 kilometers, um, and uh, the, 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 to, to a mass of about 120 tons. So it's accelerating 120 tons to four times faster than a, than a bullet. I loved the way that you just compared something that people wouldn't have any uh, conception of to something that they would and that they would be really impressed by. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, was that amazing communication? That was terrific. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you one last question, and then we're going to throw things open for the, the audience. When you talked about Mars, you said, I don't think I'll ever get there. Well, and yeah. What, um, can you talk a little about you know, a lot of us get involved in projects that we don't know if we'll see the realization. Sure. And can you talk a little bit about how you think about that and, and uh, trading off, you know, I get to do it versus it'll come later? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, going back to the sort of underlying, my underlying sort of philosophical rationale for doing it in the first, you know, Doing in the first place, um, the you know I, I, basically I, I sort of was thinking about this when I was when I was a kid and um, trying to find some meaning in life, like what's the meaning of life, you know? Um, and um, I, I got quite sort of sad about it actually when I was a teenager, um, and um, and then um, I read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, which basically said, like the, the real, the real, uh, you know, the, basically the universe is the answer, and you just need to figure out the questions. So I think, um, you know, that that's if if I, if I can help, kind of figure out the questions, uh, then that I consider that to be meaningful. Absolutely, and maybe we can all use a babble fish as well. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, uh, now it's time for you, and uh, I'm going to go, um, we're going to alternate between questions from the audience and questions from the, the uh, no, Joan, we're not, we, we won't, okay, just the audience. Okay. Um, so it's your turn. Questions for Elon. Uh, please come to the microphones that are in the uh, in the aisles, and there's somebody at this microphone. Go ahead. Thank you very much for appearing today. Uh, two weeks ago, the Los Angeles Times featured prominently on its front page a story in which it described many self-described venture capitalists from this area who were enamored by a new and as yet unspecified technique of nuclear <laughs> power generation. It did not, uh, it was promised in the article that the technique was different than those demonstrated at Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'd like to ask if you had uh, what your critical thinking skills would be when approached by people offering uh, in, you to invest or become involved in uh, new and undefined nuclear power techniques. Do you know what they're talking about? And two, uh, what do you see as the future for nuclear power in our efforts to restore the Earth to the conditions that it might have existed more closely at the start of the Anthropocene? Sure. Um, well, I, I actually am. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I think there's nothing 
wrong with nuclear power, whether fission or fusion. I think if, if a properly designed uh, fission power system is, is actually uh, fine, particularly if it's in a, an area that's not subject to natural disasters. Um, so, you know, for example, France has a lot of uh, fission power, um, and that, can, that, I think, makes a lot of sense for them. Um, but, but for California, it's more questionable, um, or Japan. Um, so th then, then, um, then, then fusion, um, I, I definitely think fusion is a solvable problem. Um, the, the, the reason I sort of ha haven't done anything in um, direct fusion is that I, I currently think, and I may be wrong about this, that, that indirect fusion um, from the, the, the big fusion explosion in the sky called the sun is, uh, you know, and, and, and having photovoltaics is, is probably going to make the most sense economically. Um, and in the, in the, northern, in the high, high latitudes in the north, northern hemisphere, you tend to have a lot of uh, hydropower. So um, that, that, t that really helps solve the, um, you know, how do you make power when it's dark uh, problem uh, or, or in the middle of winter type of thing. So um, I, I don't want to discourage people from pursuing fusion, but personally, I, I think the economics are going to favor indirect fusion of photo photovoltaics. Um, at least in, it, to, to an overwhelming degree, particularly when combined with uh, batteries and um, high voltage lines running east, west, and north, south. Um, I mean, you can completely solve Earth's, all, all the power needed on Earth um, with, a, with a fairly small per, uh, percentage of the surface area. Um, I mean, for the United States, for, you could take basically a, little, a corner of Utah or Nevada and power the entire United States um, with solar power. So I, I think that's, that's mostly how it will get solved. The next. Uh... This is a bit of a follow-up on that. Uh, solar power has been doubling um, basically every two years. And we all know that exponential growth is a powerful thing. So we're only, what, seven doublings away from everything being powered by solar power. And do you think that that doubling rate will, will keep pace? I mean? I, I think it'll probably slow down. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's still going to be a high percentage growth rate every year. Um, it, w once you reach a certain percentage of solar into the grid, you really need to add batteries in order to low level um, and, uh, and kind of cash power. Uh, but, um, but solar combined with, with batteries really, I mean, you, you kind of, like I said, you can completely solve all of Earth's power with just those, those two things. Um, so. Great. Is that Victor? You know, it's, it's, worth, it's worth noting. I think probably people are aware of this, but you, know, you get, um, it's, it, there's one gigawatt per square kilometer of solar um, energy, uh, solar power. Right. I'm Victor Zeiker Schmidt, Ocean Institute, massive fan of your work, um, uh, particularly fighting the carbon pollution. And actually, follow up on this uh, battery question, uh, we tend to start understanding how powerful the uh, carbon pollution is. But uh, uh, battery related technology and photovoltaics has a, a, its own production cycle. And I, I was wondering if you could maybe share your thoughts on what the consequences and maybe a, a remediation recycling of that would be. Yeah, well. Um, all of the battery packs for Tesla are currently recycled. Um, so the recycling centers in North America and Europe and, and Asia. Um, and, and it kind of makes sense because you can just think of the battery packs as really high quality ore. Um, mm -hmm. It's way better to <laughs> mine a battery pack than rocks. Um, so uh, so it, it kind of makes sense to, to recycle them uh, economically. Um, yeah, um, and, and that obviously reduces the, the cost of, of production quite a bit. Um, for the gigafactory that, that we're building in Nevada, uh, that will have recycling built in. So that, you know, it'll be uh, completely sort of, uh, you know, cl close that cycle. Um, and, and it will be, um, in the long term, fully uh, sustainably powered. So solar, wind, and geothermal, um, yeah. And the, the far microphone. Hi, I'm Jim Kroll from Arizona State University. Uh, I was 
um, listening to Dr. Chris McKay, another advocate of Humans to Mars, and he was talking about um, when we do go to Mars, uh, if we find life either currently there or extinct, we should uh, review, uh, consider removing human presence so we can allow that life to thrive. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. Well, I, it really doesn't seem like there's any life on, on Mars. I mean, if they're on the surface at least, um, we're not seeing any sign of that. Um, I think if we do find some sign of it, then for sure we need to understand um, you know, what it is and, and try, to, I think, try to ensure that we, we don't extinguish it. I mean, that's, uh, that's important. But I think, um, I think the reality is that there, there isn't any life on the surface of Mars. Um, there may be uh, microbial life deep underground uh, where it's sort of shielded um, from radiation and, um, and, and from the cold. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's a possibility, but in, in that case, I think anything we do on the surface is really not gonna have a big impact on the subterranean life. Um, yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Over here again. Hi. Um, with a decision coming out of COP21 just a few days ago, with the world now appearing to be on track to decarbonize the energy system, renewable energy and, of course, storage is going to become increasingly important and um, likely the development will accelerate. I'm really interested in what Tesla's doing on batteries that will help smooth the intermittency <coughs> of um, the renewable generation and would really like to hear your discussion of where you see Tesla going on battery storage for renewables and generally the whole issue of storage for renewables. Yeah, well, definitely this um, uh, battery technology is super important to sustainable energy. Um, what, what we're doing with the, the, the big factory in, that we're building in, in Nevada is just really try and take uh, economies of scale to the limit. Um, so it's like the biggest factory we could conceive of um, in order to, to maximize economies of scale. Um, and then obviously there's the underlying technology itself, um, which there, there'll be, I would say, moderate improvements in the underlying technology, um, not, not giant, but not, not small, but kind of medium. <laughs> um, but, but then over time, I would expect those, those technology improvements to get better and better. Um, and from Tesla's standpoint, we're always interested in trying to figure out how to, how to make it better. Um, I, I do think that batteries are one of the hottest technology problems out there, because um, there's so many constraints on creating a useful battery. Um, it's, it's really, I mean, so many super smart people have broken their pick on improving batteries. Uh, so, so it usually ends up being, on average, like about a 5 to 8% improvement per year in energy density um, and economics. Um, although I think we'll be able to improve the economic element a lot more just by the economies of scale. Um, but I, I, anyone who's interested in, in doing batteries, I'd certainly encourage them to uh, to, to research better batteries. It's a, it's a super hard problem and a critical one to solve. Great. Um, what do you think are the main steps in a low carbon energy transition? And in that vein, what technologies uh, out there, what technological developments do you find very interesting that you're not already working on? Things that aren't batteries or electric vehicles but that you think are cool areas for people to go into? Well, I think electrification of transport in general is important. Um, so aircraft and, and boats, um, that, that, that's pretty important. Um, and, um, and then heating and cooling, electrification of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, the nuclear stuff could be, could be quite interesting. Um, but it would just have to sort of see how it competes against uh, solar. Um, but, but yeah, and, and any, anything which, which, any form of energy generation or consumption, which if you extrapolate into the future, um, goes on for a very long time and still has the world being good, I think <laughs> we should just do that. <laughs> 
Yeah. Over here. Good morning, Pisha Hoover from Purdue University. Um, my question pertains to uh, science access and energy within the global context. Um, and I was wondering how you see any or all of your, your companies and ventures um, trying to address the, the inequity of science access or access to energy um, or, or what types of things that you're hoping to do um, within that context to try and really expand those resources um, and make it accessible to everyone. Sure. Well, um, I mean, as was mentioned earlier, um, Tesla has just made all the patents open. Um, and um, uh, so Solar City is um, actually uh, going even a step further than that, uh, which is uh, they're making the technology uh, available um, to um, uh, developing countries and and uh, they're offering to have people come from those countries and actually sit in the factory and see how it's done. So I think you know trying to be helpful in that respect. Um, and uh, but but, but I, I do think that you know the the, the internet is, is a great equalizer of access to information. Um, the, um, the you know. This is, this is maybe not talked about as much as it should be, but you can learn anything if you have a $100 internet device. You can just learn anything, it's, which is amazing compared to the past. Um, you, don't need, you don't need access to a library. Um, I mean, in principle, you could, just, you could learn whatever you want for free, really. I think that's, that's a pretty great part of the future that we're in right now. Indeed. In the end? Hi. Uh, Hiho Park from Sandia National Labs. Uh, Tesla has done a great job creating an infrastructure for electric cars in the country so far, but I don't think electric cars themselves solve greenhouse, greenhouse gas problems because we're still generating green, greenhouse gases from coal and natural power plant, natural gas power plants, which are not as efficient as um, gasoline cars. So how did you originally envision the future source of electricity, and how do you envision it now? Yeah, <clears throat> actually, um, it's, it's worth noting that uh, even if the grid was completely powered by uh, coal and natural gas, um, electric cars uh, would still generate less CO2, um, even, when you extract, even when you take it all the way to the power plant level. Um, the, the reason for that is that uh, when you're not constrained by mass and volume, you can make the, um, the, the efficiency of energy extraction much better um, in a power plant than you can in a car. Um, so if you take, say, um, like a, 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 a natural gas power plant from, from GE, it's, it's over 60% efficient. Um, so you take the source energy, 60% efficient in, in generating electricity. So it's really good. Um, whereas Typically, a gasoline-powered car over the drive cycle will be less than 20% efficient, um, and um, and, and that, that's because you, you you know the the big um, natural gas turbine is it, it can be really heavy, it can be really bulky, um, and you can take the the waste heat and then run a steam turbine um, and uh, you know get even more energy out. So your efficiency is just fundamentally much better, and so even when you take into account the transmission losses and the charging losses, uh, you're still f way far ahead with electric cars than you are with gasoline cars. So even if you can take this, do this with any source fuel, coal, uh, anything, um, you're, just, you're just always going to win, um, e even if everything's um, powered by, by CO2 sources. Um, then, then, of course, everything isn't powered by CO2 s sources. Uh, you have um, hydro, um, um, geothermal, uh, solar, wind, um, and as was pointed out by one of the earlier questioners, the um, growth of solar is very dramatic. Um, so the you know the percentage of the grid that is uh, sustainable energy is increasing over time, um, and then particularly when we add batteries to the mix, uh, that will that will further increase the rate. So I think I think we're we're on a we're headed in a positive direction, 
but it's just a question of how long it will take to get there. In fact, like one of the things I really emphasized in the Paris talk was that uh, it, it is a certainty that we will move to a sustainable energy economy um, because the alternative would be would be to, to mine all of the carbon-based fuels from the ground, burn them, um, and then you either move to a sustainable economy or the entire economy collapses because then it doesn't have any energy. So we know for sure that we'll move to a sustainable energy economy. The question is just when and and how, how many you know billions of tons of, of CO2 are uh, in the atmosphere versus in the ground. Right. That, that's really the only question is... is um, what 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 PPM number will we, you know? Stabilize. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, so, so g given that we know where we'll end up, uh, which is a sustainable energy economy, it seems like we should we should terminate this experiment as soon as possible. Why not go there first? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we don't have time for any more questions. Um, when I was walking in, one of my friends uh, was telling me how excited he was to be here. And I wrote down what he said, uh, because I think it's something we all share. He said, it's such a rare thing to see a person devote themselves to coming up with real solutions to the biggest problems and then doing it. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. All right.